Oh, well, hello there. I didn't see you come in. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to some Civil War poetry. My name is Vincent Hannum, coming to you live from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Today, we're just going to spend, like always, 10 or 15 minutes just reading some poetry of the era, um, largely between 1861 and 1865. However, there are some poems that fall outside of that. Um, some poems I've read have even been a few decades after, which have been really interesting um, in terms of seeing how that lost cause myth be uh, starts to become ingrained within the um, kind of the, 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 the mythology surrounding the Civil War. So, um, yeah, one of those lost cause figures that is going to feature today is General Stonewall Jackson. Um, there's a poem quite literally called The Dying Words of Stonewall Jackson that we're going to read here in a little bit. If you haven't done any research yourself about Stonewall Jackson, super fascinating individual just on his own right. Um, he had quirks. He was incredibly religious and... Um, which is fine. <laughs> I'm just saying, um, it, he was a very pious man and it informed a lot about his own personal decisions, which I just think is interesting. And he, uh, without doubt was one of the greatest generals in American history, uh, ever. Uh, and when he did die, that's not a spoiler. The poem is called the dying words of Stonewall Jackson. Uh, Robert E. Lee uh, acknowledged that he had just lost his right hand. Coincidentally, Stonewall Jackson did lose one of his arms in the war before he died. So uh, that poem is by Sidney Lanier. Our other poem today is uh, much more of a union um, sympathetic poem called Gettysburg. And that is by James Jeffrey Roche. So both of those poems, um, as you probably guessed, one is a Confederate poem, one is a Union poem. That's the style of this book, Poetry of the Civil War. It's divided uh, into those two camps. And each morning I read one from either side, do a little comparing and contrasting. Again, just to see how folks, at the, real folks at the time, were feeling about this war, this traumatic event at least poetically. So uh, before we begin, I just want to let you know that there are links below to each of those poems for you to follow along and like, share, subscribe, do all those fun things uh, with my channel um, and look forward to many more exciting uh, literature-based history talks uh, coming down the road. So, our first poem that we will read is Gettysburg. Like I said, that is by James Jeffrey Roche. He lived from 1847 to 1908, was born in Queens County, Ireland. He was raised and educated in Prince Edward Island, then a, Brit then a British colony. He emigrated to Boston in 1866, where he found editorial work on The Pilot. His first book, Songs and Satires, was published in 1887. Is there anything else on the next page? There is not. So that's all this book has on James Jeffrey Roche. If you are a big Roche fan, do let me know. Shout it out in the comments. Um, share with the world everything. Uh, the James Jeffrey, the JJR fan club has to offer. Always interested. So the poem is called Gettysburg. And if you do not know, Gettysburg was the, is the most well-known battle of the war in 1863. Uh, Confederate forces for the first time invaded the North up until this point. They had only been fighting a defensive war. Um, but you know, they were like, let's invade the North. Let's go right into Pennsylvania. Let's win on their land. If we get a victory, some European nations will actually take us seriously and help us out. One big stake. Second big stake being <laughs> had the, uh, Southern army won that battle. They were marching straight on to Philadelphia to burn it to the ground. Uh, the way the Northern Army had done so many Southern cities. So 
yeah, the stakes literally could not have been higher. This is Gettysburg. There was no union in the land. The wise men labored long with links of clay and ropes of sand to bind the right and wrong. There was no temper in the blade that once could cleave a chain. Its edge was dull with touch of trade and clogged with rust of gain. The sand and clay must shrink away before the lava tide. By blows and blood and fire assay, the metal must be tried. Here sledge and anvil met, and when the furnace fiercest roared, God's undiscerning working men reforged his people's sword. Enough for them to ask and know the moment's duty clear. The bayonets flashed in there below, the guns proclaimed it here. To do and dare and die at need, but while life lasts to fight. For right or wrong, a simple creed, but simplest for the right. They faltered not who stood that day and held this post of dread, nor cowards they who wore the gray until the gray was red. For every wreath the victor wears, the vanquished half may claim, and every monument declares a common pride and fame. We raise no altar stones to hate, who never bowed to fear. No province crouches at our gate to shame our triumph here. Here, standing by a dead wrong's grave, the blindest now may see. The blow that liberates the slave, but sets the master free. When ills beset the nation's life, too dangerous to bear, the sword must be the surgeon's knife, too merciful to spare. O soldier of our common land, tis thine to bear that blade, loose in the sheath or firm in hand, but, but ever unafraid. When foreign foes assail our right, one nation trusts to thee, to wield it well in worthy fight, the sword of Meade and Lee. James Jeffrey Roche, Gettysburg. A couple things, the sword of Meade and Lee. That refers to, of course, Robert E. Lee, who was commanding the Confederate Army, and uh, General Meade, who was uh, his counterpart in the North. Yeah, so I would be interested in knowing when this poem was written. It seems to have a certain um, flair of looking back on this battle rather than being there at the time. Uh, just the way it kind of not romanticizes the battle, but there is a longing of this had to be done. And this is comparing the blade, the sword to a surgeon's knife, too merciful to spare. The quickest, the most humane thing to do is just cut it out. Just get it done. Um, some, some nice acknowledgements of uh, the liberated slaves fighting for their freedom. Yeah, if anyone wants to help me in my research, go for it. The poem is, again, Gettysburg by James Jeffrey Roche. Okay, so moving on to our Confederate poem. It is The Dying Words of Stonewall Jackson. Starts off with a quote. I think literally the dying words. Order A.P. Hill to prepare for battle. Tell Major Hawks to advance the commiss... <laughs> tell major hawks to advance the commissary train tell let us cross the river and rest in the shade the stars of night contain the glittering day and rain his glory down with sweeter grace upon the dark world's grand enchanted face all loath to turn away and so the day upon to yield his breath utters the stars until the listening night to stand for burning fair thee wells of light set on the verge of death. O hero life that lit us like the sun, O hero words that glittered like the stars and stood shone above the gloomy wars when the hero life was done. The phantoms of a battle came to dwell in the fitful vision of his dying eyes, yet even in battle dreams he sends supplies to those he loved so well. His army stands in battle line arrayed, his couriers fly, all's done, now God decide. And not till then saw he the other side, or would accept the shade. 
Though land whose sun is gone, thy stars remain. Still shine the words that miniature his deeds. O thrice beloved, where'er thy great heart bleeds, solace hast thou for pain. So just kind of a, a send off there. I, I mean, say, I mean, politics aside, I do think Stonewall Jackson had a nice last word. <laughs> it's one of those uh, legendary dying words. Let us cross the river and rest in the shade. That's just a man who's done. <laughs> he just wants to sit under that tree. Uh, before I wrap it up, I do want to uh, just point out, I did not read the bio for James Jeffrey Roche, so got to do that quick. He lived from 1847 to 1908. I did read the bio for James Jeffrey Roche. I did not read the bio for Sidney Lanier. He lived from 1842 to 1881, was born in Macon, Georgia. He enlisted in the Confederate Army and served in Virginia, North Carolina, and Florida. In 1863, he was captured and imprisoned, an experience which served to inspire a novel, Tiger Lilies, in 1867. Lanier practiced law for a few years after the war before settling into a career delivering lectures on English literature. A prolific writer, he was the author of a number of books, the bulk of which deal with literary scholarship. A collection of his verse, Poems of Sidney Lanier, 1884, was published posthumously. Okay, he's got some uh, accomplishments under his belt. Tomorrow, we are visiting an old friend. Her name is Emily Dickinson, and her poem, It Feels a Shame to Be Alive. Couldn't have said it better myself, Emily. The second poem we are featuring tomorrow is called Under the Shade Trees. All right, just keeping up with that theme. And it is by Margaret Junkin Preston, another poet we have featured on this show. So there you go. The book is Poetry of the Civil War, the podcast. This is, this show, not on the air yet, uh, is some Civil War poetry. I'm Vincent Hannum. Have a great day, everybody. And happy opening day to all my fellow baseball fans. See you tomorrow.